Well, during the Wednesdays of Lent, we are going through the Lord's Prayer and the way that Jesus teaches us to pray and what we can learn about not just prayer, but our relationship with Jesus, what he calls us to as his followers, and how you and I can live our faith out in the real world, in our everyday lives as representatives of Christ on earth. And the season of Lent is about a lot of things, right? At least that's what you will hear if you go online and look at Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. If you go read articles, there's all kinds of theories about what the season of Lent is about. Now, one of the things about pastors that I want you to know is that we have opinions on a lot of stuff, okay? And when you get two or more people together, Jesus says, there I am also, right? That's a promise in the Bible. But what happens when you get two or more pastors together is a lot of opinions colliding. And this week on Facebook, I got to witness, because I refuse to participate because it is not healthy for me, uh, several of my classmates who are pastors as well now, begin an argument on the internet, right? Because that's what we use the internet for as human beings, to make opinions and then disagree about those opinions in the comment section. And my friend, well, they're all my friends, so I was kind of just laughing from afar, right? had talked about one of the things that Lent is about or one of the things it's not about. And then, of course, because this is what pastors do, is we have opinions on your theological post, okay? So this is what happened to my friend. He made a post about what Lent is and what it's not about, and then there was discussion. And at the center of the discussion in his post was this, that some people think Lent is about giving something or sometimes some things up. Anybody ever heard that notion, that idea, right? That Lent, part of a big focus of Lent is, what did you give up this year for Lent? And sometimes we have wonderful, holy answers. Sometimes we have very spiritually mature answers. And other times we just say, I'm giving up chocolate. All right, now if you're giving up chocolate, God bless you, good luck, okay? I'm not trying to shame you, okay? <laughs> All right. And then the flip side of it is, well, maybe instead of giving something up for Jesus, we should begin doing something extra. Anybody ever heard that reverse idea for Lent, right? Instead of giving up, and it's like, oh, good. And so there was this back and forth about, was Lent really about this? Is that the focus of Lent and all kinds of stuff? Well, that might be a tradition of Lent that you might continue to practice or you at least have heard of. There are things like Lenten suppers, right? We're blessed to have those here. There are Lenten midweek services and Ash Wednesday to add to our ability to take time out of our lives to have a special focus on Jesus during the season. But here's what I want you to understand as we go through the season of Lent. Lent is not about those things. It's tempting to make it about those things. It's tempting to make our focus on those traditions. It's tempting to find, you know, some pride or encouragement in our giving things up and sticking with it or picking up new spiritual practices and sticking with it or whatever it might be. But here's ultimately what Lent is all about. It's about Jesus. See, when we do all those other things and add everything onto it, Lent becomes about me, becomes about myself, right? Now, we want during the season of Lent and really throughout the whole year as Christ followers to have times of self-reflection and examination, times of repentance and turning away from our ways and towards God's ways. But ultimately, the only way you and I pull that off is by focusing on Jesus and not ourselves. And so as we dive in during Lent into the Lord's Prayer, I want for you to maintain during the season of Lent and throughout the rest of the year 
a focus on Jesus. Yes, there is repentance, there is change that needs to happen in our lives, but it only happens if we stay focused on Christ more than we stay focused on ourselves. And the book of Hebrews even tells us to do this. He calls Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. Now, right before that, the author of Hebrews says, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, right? Fixing not just our physical eyes, but the eyes of our hearts and minds, fixing the focus of our lives on who? Jesus, not myself. So if your intention during Lent is to say, I want to grow and mature my faith and my relationship with Jesus. I want to become more like him. I want to be closer to him. Here's the secret to pulling it off according to God's word. You fix your eyes on Jesus, not yourself. So if you slip up and you're having a really stressful day and when no one's looking, you slip an extra piece of chocolate into your lunch, God's still gonna love you, okay? You're still gonna be able to grow closer to Christ and follow him because he's the focus of our lives and our faith, not ourselves. So if you have a Bible with you, I'm gonna be referring to several passages, but we're gonna be beginning with the Lord's Prayer. You can also find it in the bulletin, and I can't tell you how hard it is for me to read it the way I have it printed in the bulletin, the way it's printed in my English translation here, because I grew up In the first grade, we had to memorize the Lord's Prayer at our Lutheran school with the King James Version. Anybody know that one by heart? I can't, I don't read the King James regularly. I don't speak Shakespeare, okay? But when I tried to read that to y'all just a little bit ago in service, that was a struggle because I can't help myself but start saying the these and the thous and the thys, okay? I just... It's the way I read it. But we're going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer throughout the season of Lent, And tonight, what I want to do is look at this line where Jesus says in verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus is giving you and me, his disciples, instructions on how to pray. But I also believe that more than just, hey, I want you to say this prayer when you pray, Right? I think Jesus intended to give us the Lord's Prayer for more than just when you get together in a church service, say it out of tradition because it's nice. I think through this prayer, he was teaching us about our relationship with God and also how he wants us to live here on earth. So he's telling us, here's how I want you to pray. You're praying to your heavenly Father who loves you and hears your prayers, and then we tell God, I want your will to be done, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now this is a good and beautiful prayer, right? Because it's the Lord's prayer. How many of you agree that it's a beautiful prayer? Right? We're like, yeah, it's a good one. Jesus gave it to us, it's good. <clears throat> Outside of the Lord's prayer, how often, this is a kind of a confronting question, how often are we genuinely praying for the Lord's will to be done. Now maybe you're better than me. I don't always pray for the Lord's will. A lot of my prayers, if you go by percentages, the greater percentage of my prayer is letting God know, here's my will, right? Here's what I would like to see happen. Here's when I want it to see happen. That's usually a big struggle for us, right? The timing of things. So we're telling God, here's what I want to happen, here's when I want it to happen, and in fact, Lord, here's how I want it to happen. And a lot of times, if you, you know, you examine Pastor Mark's prayer life, <laughs> a huge percentage of my prayer life looks like that. Where I'm telling God, here is my will, and the, the Greek word for will means desire. It's not just here's my intentions, but it's here's my desire, here's what I want, here's when I want it, and here's how I want it. Now, of course, the Bible tells us, well, you can bring all your requests to God, and that's good. We should bring all of our requests to God. Now, in times of humility and humbleness, at the end of those prayers, I will say, and maybe you've done this too, but you know, Lord, thy will be done, amen, right? 
Or we quote Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. Anybody want to join me in this confession booth right now? <laughs> Just say like, yeah, a lot of my prayers are this, and then to sound good and nice about it, I'll tack on at the end, but not my will, yours be done, Lord. I got to be honest, a lot of times I don't know why I say that, because if you look at my prayer, it's 99%. Here's my will of what I want done. Now, nobody likes a hypocrite, right? Anybody enjoy being around hypocrites? Have, I mean, you have them in your life because it's called being a human. But we don't enjoy it when people are hypocrites. And this is one of the things I like about Jesus. He says, here's how I want you to pray. Go out and say, your kingdom come and then your will be done, Lord. Now, after I just confessed to you that I struggle to pray like that because of my own sinful nature, if I just got up here and railed at you, and it's like, you're all bad prayers, right? And you need to be praying, your will be done, and then told you to go home, none of you would like that. Why? Because you would look at me and you would go, you're a big fat hypocrite. You are a liar, right? Why should I do it if you won't even do it, right? Especially when it comes to pastors and preachers. Nobody wants a pastor to get up in front of you and say, this is how you ought to pray and live if I'm not doing it, right? How many of you would enjoy that if that's regularly what was happening? You'd be like, good job, pastor, keep it up, <laughs> right? No, you'd be like, hey, you gotta, you know, practice what you preach, Right? And here's what I love about Jesus. He's preaching, he's teaching, he's telling the disciples, he's telling you to me, I want you to pray for God's will. But here's what Jesus does. In John chapter five, verse 30, Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is why Hebrews tells us, if you wanna grow in your faith, if you want to mature in your faith, you want God's will to be the will for your life, the only way you and I are going to do it is not looking at ourselves and say, I got to pray better, I got to work harder, I got to strive more. Instead, the book of Hebrews says, you need to look to Jesus. You need to fix your eyes on him. And what I love about Jesus is he's not a hypocrite. He doesn't tell you and me and the church and the disciples, pray for the Lord's will, for the Father's will to be done and then go do his own thing. Jesus himself says, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father. And so if you and I are gonna learn how do we do this, how do we pray like this in an authentic way, we've gotta focus on Jesus. And here's how you and I focus on Jesus during the season of Lent. One of the most popular words during Lent is that we repent, and then the second thing that we do is we place our hope in Christ who lived and did it perfectly for us. So let's first talk about that word repent when it comes to praying for God's will, living for God's will in our own lives. How many of you think, show of hands, God's will is good? I'm not asking if you always agree with it and the timing of it, right? We're humans, we have our own opinions. But we'd all agree, as Bible-believing Christians, God's will, God's plans are good. In fact, if we are honest, we'd all probably admit, not only is God's will and God's plans good, they're also perfect, right? The perfect how, the perfect when, the perfect what. Now, here's the reality. We could admit this, and I, I trust that we believe it. Right, but we still need repentance. So here's the deal. We love God's will when we think it's good for us. Now, I know we say, like, oh, it's always good, but sometimes it doesn't always feel good. The way he does things, the timing he does things, how he does things, it doesn't always feel good or feel the way that we think they should go. But there are times when we do love God's will. Here's an example. Jeremiah 29, 11. Very famous verse. God speaks to the prophet Jeremiah. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans 
for welfare, plans for peace and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. So how many of you like that version of God's will for your life, right? I can't tell you throughout my pastoral ministry how many people have quoted this Bible verse to me over and over and over and over again, or have it as artwork in the homes. And that's great, it's a reminder of God's promises. But when we think of God's will, we think of that version, right? He's gonna give me a future, he's gonna give me peace, he's gonna give me hope, and I want that. Would we agree? Isn't that the good version of God's will? Now here's where the repentance comes in, because you're like, why would I need to repent? I'm trusting God's promises, this is great. Well, because God's will doesn't always line up with your will, with your desires. His definition of a future and peace and hope can often look very different than the way we think it should go or be going. And so several times in the Gospels, Jesus tells his disciples, and he tells you and me, and he tells the crowds that are following him, here's what you need to do to follow God's will in your life. You need to deny yourself every single day. Now this is part of how we developed the tradition of giving things up for Lent. It was a practice of I'm going to deny myself in order to focus more on Jesus. Now I gotta tell you, I don't like when Jesus tells me to do that. I don't, like I, I mean I know I'm supposed to as a Christian love all the words of Jesus and I do love all the words of Jesus but I just don't like it when he says, here's what I want you to do Mark. I don't, he doesn't call me pastor, right? he just calls me Mark. Right? I want you to deny yourself, die, deny your will, your desires, your wishes and your plans and follow mine instead. Now on paper it sounds good, right? Well, that's what Jesus wants. Now here's the reality, we all struggle with it. In fact, when Jesus says it, each time the crowds that hear it walk away from him. Oh, yeah, that's too hard. I don't wanna do that. Because I'm okay with God's will for my life when it's Jeremiah 29, 11. I got good plans for you. Peace, hope, a future, welfare, I'm gonna take care of you. Oh yeah, bring it on, Lord. And then when he says, though, Here's my plan for you, my will for you. I want you to deny yourself. Not just during Lent, <laughs> but every day. Okay, yeah, I, I don't like that anymore. I wanna go back to Jeremiah. Does anybody else feel this way ever? All right. Now here's the three times Jesus says it. I'm gonna read it all three times just so we get the point. In the Gospel of Mark, verse or chapter eight, verse 34, Jesus says, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In Luke nine, verse 23, Jesus said to all the crowd, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Generally speaking, when Jesus repeats himself, he wants us to listen. That's my Bible reading advice to you. When you see something repeated by Jesus, you should pause and listen. Now here's the really interesting thing about this, the context of when Jesus says this all three times in the gospel. It happens all three times after Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's a great moment for Peter, right? He gets it. Jesus is going, who do you say I am? Who do the crowd say I am? And Peter, for once in his life, speaks up and nails it, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And right after that, Jesus looks at Peter and the disciples and says, okay, here's God's will. Remember, Jesus said in John, I don't seek my own will, I seek whose will? The Father's. And P Jesus looks at Peter and the disciples and he says, here's the Father's will, that the Son of Man, Jesus, will be arrested and betrayed, he will be beaten and crucified and die. And in all three cases, 
Peter speaks up and says, I'm never going to let that happen. And Jesus' response to Peter is, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself, pick up your cross every single day and die to yourself. So Jesus is saying in this holy, awesome moment, here is the Father's will, that the Son would suffer, die, and then rise again. And Peter says, well, you know what, Lord? Here's my will. It's never going to happen on my watch. I'm not going to let you do the Father's will. We're going to do my will. We're going to do Peter's desires and Peter's will. And then Jesus looks at Peter and he looks at the disciples and he looks at you and he says, well, here's what you need to do then if you feel that way. You need to get rid of your own will. You need to deny yourself. You need to pick up the cross and die to yourself and follow me every single day. See, ultimately, this requires repentance on our part. Now, I know you're Christians. You're here because you love Jesus, and you know, of course, he went to the cross, and he died, and he rose again. That's the whole reason we're here, Pastor Mark, right? But here's the reality. We are like Peter. We're not telling Jesus, don't go to the cross. But when Jesus says, here's my will, here's the Father's will for your life of how I want you to live, Right? If you read the Gospels, you read the New Testament, he's very clear. I want you to be generous. I want you to forgive. I want you to love your enemies. I want you to think of others more highly than yourself. And the list goes on. He says, this is how I want you to live as my father. Here's the, the holiness I have called you to. And in that sacred moment, like Peter, we stand up and go, yeah, you know what, Lord? Never going to happen. I don't want your will for my life. Maybe you don't say it as bluntly. We tell God, I don't want your will for your life. I want my will for my life. And if you're struggling with this, you feel like I'm being too blunt, here's the nice way of putting it. How many of you have ever been frustrated with God's timing on something? Just show ahead. Let's just be all authentic tonight. There you go. You know what the root of that frustration is? It's joining Peter and saying, I don't want your will for my life. I want my will. I don't want what you want. I want what I want. And so Jesus tells us, here's what you got to do then. You got to deny yourself. That's not fun. You gotta give things up. You gotta go to the cross and die every day. Be made new every single day through his grace and mercy and forgiveness for you. And then you follow him wherever he leads, whenever he leads, however he leads. Now here's the good news for you and me. This ultimately leads to hope for us. Because earlier we all agreed God's will is good and perfect, right? Even if sometimes we're frustrated, even if we act foolish like Peter, we stand up, I don't like it. Ultimately, God's will is good and perfect for you and me. And when Jesus responds to Peter this way, he's not being mean to Peter. He's not being mean to you and me. He's pointing out Peter, God's will is better than yours because ultimately what was God's will? The very thing you and I gather to celebrate every time we worship, that Christ went to the cross and died for your sins, and then after three days, he rose from the dead. That was God's will. So here's how this leads to hope for you and me, how repenting and turning to the cross each day, trusting in Christ each day, following Christ each day leads to hope for you and me. In John chapter 6, Jesus answers the question, what is God's will for my life? It is my favorite, sarcastically, question that I get asked as a pastor. Pastor, could you help me discern what God's will for my life is? I gotta tell y'all guys, I'm still trying to figure out his will for my life. So once I get that down, I will share the secret with you, okay? Is that a fair trade? 
I always chuckle, I'm like, I am, I'm just as confused as you are, guys, sometimes. You have people coming to me, Pastor, could you just help me figure this out? If I knew, I would write a book, and it would sell, and then I would tell you, okay? But here's ultimately the real answer. Jesus gives it to you and me. So if you've ever wondered, what is God's will for my life? Here's what Jesus says. John chapter six, verse 29. I want you to write it down so you don't have to ask me anymore. And because I love you and I want you to remember it. John chapter six, verse 29. Jesus answered them, this is the work, this is the will of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So, if you've been running around like crazy trying to figure out what is God's will for my life, I want you to take a moment to take a deep breath and relax. Because if you believe in Jesus, if you have denied yourself, if you've repented of your sin and you've trusted in the cross of Christ and his death and resurrection, you are already doing God's will for your life. So that should just relieve some stress for us, relieve some anxiety for us, because ultimately here's God's will for you and the world, that we would trust and believe in the one he sent, Jesus Christ. And the way you and I get to the point where we believe and trust in the one that he has sent, the way that you and I live out the prayer of your will be done on earth is that we deny ourselves every day by turning to the cross, confessing our sins, admitting I'm not perfect, then Lord, I need the Holy Spirit in my life to guide me and to make me more like Jesus. And that we trust in that very cross that he went to to die and forgive those very sins. And ultimately, St. Paul reminds us that God's will is really big, that it's not just for you and me, so one way we live it out is we personally live it out. We deny our own wills. We pick up our cross. We trust in Christ every single day for forgiveness and grace and mercy. And the other way that we live out God's will in our lives is that we share that good news of hope with the rest of the world. This is what St. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires or who wills all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So there's two ways you and I live this prayer out in our lives. When we say, Lord, your will be done. The first is that we repent. We confess that I need to deny myself, I need to confess my sins, I need to turn to the cross of Christ for forgiveness. And the second is that we live in hope that God loves all people, that he cares for every single person, and that he wants everybody to know who Jesus is. And so in that hope, we go out into the world and we say, I'm living for God's will. How do I do that, right? Well, Paul tells us, well, here's God's will, that every single person would know who Jesus is, that every single person would trust in him and believe in him and receive forgiveness and salvation. And so the way you and I live out God's will in our lives is that you trust in Jesus as your savior, and then you share that love and hope with the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are a gracious and forgiving Savior, that each time that we come to you to, at the cross, admitting our shortcomings, admitting our sin and pride, you lift us up, forgive us, and redeem us. Holy Spirit, help us to follow the will of Jesus in our lives every single day by being obedient to him and sharing the good news of the gospel with the world around us. In your name we pray, amen.